gonna do some quick introductions. So we have a panel here. We're very excited uh, to announce that we have Nicole Ashkikogan, uh, who's a scientific director of the Awatan Healing Lodge Society in Alberta. Also joining us is Deborah Sinclair. She's a social worker in private practice, focusing on women and children who experience domestic violence and custody and access assessments. We also have Deepa Matu, who's the executive director of the Barbara Schleifer Clinic in Toronto. And then lastly, we have Jeannie Dolan Cake, who's a social worker in Montreal. <coughs> She'll be speaking in French. Um, so for those of you on the English side, you'll be hearing an interpretation of her words. So we're just going to start the panel off. Um, I know that we are a little tight for time, so we'll probably ask a question and then um, we'll give you guys about three to four minutes to respond to it. Uh, so the first question is, uh, given everything that we've been hearing and listening in terms of the survivors' experiences, how have these experiences um, made you think about doing anything different in your work? And if so, what have you been doing that's been different based on what you've been hearing? And I'll go first with uh, Deborah because she's on my screen first. So Deborah, thanks, Julie. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Uh, I'm coming uh, from Toronto. Thank you uh, very much. It's been an incredible uh, conference. Uh, I'm very, very honored to be here. And uh, the survivor stories throughout this conference have been so moving and touching. Um, they have been the center of my work, my life's work, which has been 40 plus years now. And uh, I suspect it will continue to be until I die. Uh, once you open your eyes to injustice, it's pretty hard to um, close them again, ever. And so I just like to share three or four points. Um, and someone help me keep on time. I'm used to talking a long time. So I'm not very good at this three or four minute business. Um, first of all, I will say quickly that I use a radical tool. And that radical tool is believing women and children and what they tell me. Uh, I've spent a lifetime doing that. Um, they are at the center of everything that I do. Um, I think uh, it's shocking to me in 2021 that we still live in a world that has been so eloquently described by so many survivors throughout this conference. I hear every day in my office um, that in almost every system I have worked with, women are not believed. They're still considered to be manipulative, to be lying, to be looking for leverage in a custody and access case. I hear it every day. Um, having to prove themselves. For me as a trauma therapist and as someone on a decolonizing journey uh, for a lifetime, we're fighting colonial and patriarchal values and beliefs every day in every system, in my view. Uh, and even those that are individual allies in each sector um, who believe women and kids and hold women accountable, we're still very much in the minority. Um, during the q and I'll talk a bit about some of the expert witness work I do and some of the, I don't do custody and access assessments, but I work with many people who do. And I often challenge what they do because frankly, in most cases, IPV, intimate partner violence, coercive control is completely ignored. Um, there's an assumption of high conflict and a level playing field, no acknowledgement of who the dominant aggressor is, no acknowledgement of um, who is the driver of the conflict. And that is a life sentence for women. If you get it wrong in the beginning, it's horrendous. I'm now dealing with children and grandchildren who have grown up in these situations. And I, I call coercive control, slow femicide. And some of you know, I do work on the death review committee here in Ontario. Um, the other thing I've learned uh, from, from survivors is uh, when women get settled into a safer life, they give back. I personally have never been in the company of a more generous, inspiring, brave, bold, strong group of women. It's a privilege for me. I consider it sacred work. I consider much of my work to be homicide prevention work. Um, Any last thoughts? <laughs> last thoughts. Oh my gosh, I've hardly begun. You, you can always uh, 
You can always talk about it in the Q&A as well. Okay, I'll just say that in the Q&A, what I'd like to talk about is um, the critically important part that so many have said is deep listening, active collaboration, nothing ever goes out of my office that a woman doesn't approve of, and we write it together, even though I may sign it, we write it together, and it's a truth-telling process for her and, and for me. So uh, with that, I'll say big bitch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. And so I believe our next person that we'll be turning to will be Nicole. Um, Nicole, any experiences, um, uh, have these experiences made you think about how you do things differently in your work? Yes, so absolutely. Listening to survivors and their stories and their experiences points out something that's um, being done, and I speak from an Indigenous scope um, for Indigenous families, is that colonization and its impacts are ignored in um, the women's experiences. And so what tends to happen to a lot of our women is individualizing them, pathologizing them, and then thinking, telling them that they're sick and they need some kind of medication or therapy for it. When really, um, and, and we individualize it too by calling it domestic violence, when it's very much within a family sphere and community sphere. And so what we end up really not seeing then is that it's, it's more about family and community violence and that the crisis is not so much about family violence as it is, is that there is a colonization crisis occurring for this, these women. And the really difficult parts in being a service provider to Indigenous women are women of cultures who have um, suffered the impacts of colonization is ignoring their experiences of racism, um, sexism, which are the two twins that push colonization. And so what we tend to do is we colonize them in our in our approach with them, which we heard many of the women explaining, you know, we um, want to give advice and solve their problems rather than listen. We want to do it for them because it's more convenient to do it for them rather than to let them, you know, grab onto the rope that we're offering and help pull themselves up. We want to rescue them. You know, sometimes we make excuses. And then worst of all, we, we, we help sometimes set really uh, unrealistic promises or thresholds for them to reach when they have no way of doing that. And, and um, what we end up doing them is forcing them to make a choice. You know, we, we want them ready for that change right now, whether or not it's the best thing or not. And so often what we find on um, how we're recolonizing these women through violence once more is that, you know, we, we do this often because we're uncomfortable as a service provider. We don't want to feel their pain. We, we don't want to go through the pains of intergenerational trauma. And so it's very hard to do what they're asking for, which is to give them access to staff that have cultural knowledge that's inseparable from decolonizing anti-racist and trauma-informed practices. And so every story I heard coming from the women was each and every time. Um, if the solution wasn't based on what the service provider or the courts felt was the solution, then there was no solution. They're constantly being forced into making choices for ease and convenience of a system, which again is, is acting in a way that's colonial violence. And so I think the most important thing that I've learned is that um, whatever you call it, domestic violence, intimate violence or family violence um, for, for indigenous women, it's colonization that's the crisis. And so that's what I, I have learned yep. in my practice and in the stories. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Those are some really insightful thoughts. Um, next, I'll turn it to Deepa Matu. Deepa, uh, do you want to give your um, thoughts on that question? Uh, thank you. Um, I first of all, I want to start by saying that uh, how honored um, I feel um, getting an opportunity to listening to survivors um, directly, and and I want to congratulate uh, for all the all the brilliant work done in making sure that the work of the of the people with lived experiences at the center of the conversation and at the clinic uh, where I work and for uh, 25 odd years of my work in the sector. Um, that's been my my focus, um, keeping the the voice of the sur survivor, client, person with the lived experience, whatever whatever you use in your practice, um, 
the person sitting in front of me is the driver of the, their experience. Uh, they are um, sitting in front of me as someone who is going to uh, take in charge and I am on a journey with them. And everyone connects with that notion differently. For me personally, I have always identified myself uh, at a personal level as a witness and, and not necessarily that I'm the one as a lawyer who's going to find the solution. The solution has to be uh, worked out uh, alongside and not necessarily for them. So definitely the Eurocentric model of savior complex is something that I have worked against mm. all my life. Um, in terms of the legal uh, component, because I'm a lawyer in the room, I want to identify something very, very important here from the stories that we were just interacting with and the experiences that we were just listening to. Um, the clients uh, or the, the survivors who come to the clinic in a recent survey that we did for a national action plan consultation, we discovered that 90% of the time in terms of their service need, legal advice is, is at the top of that percentile, followed by mm -hmm. counseling at the 80%, followed by affordable housing at the 80%, um, counseling and support for their family, which is their children and their loved ones at 70%. Mm -hmm. so, so that 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 a small sample of information informs me that legal framework, which is again very Eurocentric, very colonizer centric, is the piece which actually is somewhere, somewhere um, they are not given a full whole person approach. They are not necessarily given an approach where uh, they could make choices. It's, it's mm -hmm. something which is pushed onto them and they, have, they are left sometimes with their own devices with very little support to actually navigate that system. Uh, so system navigators in the form of say family court support workers program that we have here at the clinic and province has it now in many spaces is one of those out of the box solution that uh, we have been working with. But at the same time, I think what I really think needs to happen and what I was really hearing very clearly from that deep listening conversation is that there has to be a, a process in place which is triaging everyone's situation based on their personal sense of urgency, which the system doesn't do. We do either first come first save serve basis, or we do an assessment based on what we have available. We never put people's own personal urgency at the center of the conversation. And that's where we miss the boat. That's where we miss the solution that people are actually looking from us. So that is something that I was listening to in that deep listening conversation. Um, and a few things that I think are important to identify, um, racialized women, black women, women with precarious immigration status, the continued vulnerability of the violence is by the structural violence. It actually stems out of the broken system. And as Audre Lorde says it, you know, sometimes broken system is not necessarily the system that you should be working with. So actually, working towards reforming the system, asking for those family court judges to actually get educated in violence and understanding how the violence impacts children and how children witnessing violence is violence, I think is really, really the key and, and need of the hour yeah, as well. Absolutely. So with that, I will wrap up. Um, and um, and I, I will also be in the question answer room to, to ha have other uh, further conversations. Thank mm. you. Thank you, Deepa. Those were some really powerful words and very well said. Mm -hmm. And so our last uh, panelist speaker that we'd like to hear from is Jeannie Dolan Cake. Jeannie, do you have any comments? Oui, bonjour. Merci tout d'abord pour uh, me donner la chance aussi de, de, de parler et de vous entendre aujourd'hui. Tout d'abord, je voudrais commencer par mentionner que je suis une femme blanche et allochtone. Pour moi, c'est important de me situer. Euh, je suis en ce moment sur le territoire de la nation Ganengaaga à Djurdjagi. C'est important pour moi de le mentionner parce que je pense que euh, c'est important de contextualiser mes propos d'aujourd'hui. Bien sûr, les observations que je vais faire et les apprentissages que j'ai faits tout au cours, je les dois aux survivantes, à mes collègues, aux différents professeurs qui m'ont accompagnée à mon tour, dont Dr. Re Cathy Richardson et l'équipe du Response-Based Practice. En écoutant les histoires des survivantes, je repensais constamment à la manière dont moi j'ai été éduquée comme travailleuse sociale, mais aussi à la manière dont j'ai moi-même éduqué en étant enseignante et à tout mon parcours académique. 
La première chose que je me suis dit, c'est l'importance de faire la différence sur la manière dont les femmes résistent la violence et se protègent elles-mêmes et leurs enfants dans le contexte et l'analyse de ce qu'ils font, de ce qui est sécuritaire à un moment précis et dans un contexte précis. Cette différence de perspective se trouve à la fois dans, le, euh, dans notre manière de rentrer en relation avec les survivants, de poser des questions et surtout d'écrire nos rapports, comme disait Déborah, qui est très souvent peut être utilisé contre les femmes dans des procédures, par exemple par la protection de la jeunesse, ou encore dans la manière de changer, de réfléchir nos organisations. L'importance de mettre la lumière euh, sur les moyens que les survivantes et leurs enfants ont mis en place pour protéger eux-mêmes et leurs familles paraît, est très importante. En fait, une, une participante me disait la manière dont, comme enfant victime de violence, elle avait une fraction de 20 à 30 secondes pour courir voir ses grands-parents et les avertir de quel état était leur, son père, donc l'agresseur, pour mieux protéger sa famille et les enfants. Mettre en lumière comment la survivante et les enfants répondent aux actes de violence pour se protéger nous aide à mieux comprendre les enjeux en termes de sécurité observés par les survivants et d'intervenir de manière plus holistique et globale. L'important de noter aussi que, que tous ces savoirs, ces fines façons d'y répondre dans le contexte spécifique où les survivantes se trouvent, euh, nous luttons également entre autres au, au au blâme de la, mada, de la mère qui est souvent utilisée dans la protection de la jeunesse. On dit souvent que la mère a failli à protéger ses enfants, mais en mettant de l'avant les actes de résistance et les manières dont elle se protégeait, on lutte contre l'idée de la psychiatrisation en fait de la mère et des actes de résistance. D'ailleurs, un point euh, central que j'ai appris, c'est de me questionner, euh, autant comme agent de recherche que comme professeur, que comme intervenant. Qui je suis? Qu'est-ce que je représente pour cette personne-là? Quelle violence en termes de réponse sociale déjà reçue dans leur vie je représente? Et je, de mettre de l'avant en posant la question, comment vous avez été reçu lorsque vous avez dévoilé la, la violence? Il y a également plusieurs proches qui m'ont parlé de l'importance, entre autres, euh, d'avoir des services pour l'agresseur. Plusieurs m'ont mentionné que l'agresseur avait été dans des hôpitaux, dans des hôpitaux psychiatriques, dans des centres de désintoxication ou encore que les policiers étaient venus à la maison peu avant de commettre les homicides ou les tentatives d'homicide et que l'institution avait soit dans certains cas blâmé la femme de laisser l'agresseur ou soit simplement retourné l'agresseur à la maison sans noter les comportements violents et ou sans offrir de services pour, pour contrer ce comportement violent malgré les drapeaux rouges évidents. Donc aujourd'hui, c'est un peu ce que je voulais mettre de l'avant, entre autres l'importance de, de, de mettre dans, au cœur les actes de résistance pour respecter la dignité des femmes et de leurs enfants, mais aussi de reconnaître les violences qui sont « ongoing », donc les violences qui sont continues, euh, et de reconnaître que les violences conjugales sont dans un spectre de violences vécues par la survivante, autant dans le racisme, le colonialisme, le capacitisme, euh, ce qui est extrêmement important de saisir pour mieux saisir les réalités des survivantes et leurs réponses face à ces violences. Donc, c'est ce que je voulais un peu vous partager aujourd'hui. Merci. Thank you very much for those words, Jenny. Um, all of you have given us um, a lot to think about in how we can help um, change the way we do our practice and really thinking about putting Um, the people that we are serving first um, and thinking about their context. Uh, the ideas of the structures that we've put into place and how they can be even more harming are such important things to think about as we move forward in how we do service. 